the Garden of Eden. Cracked soil is usually taken as a symbol of dearth, but in fact it means just the opposite. This is proof that ample rain has fallen at least once this year. And God had not caused it to rain. sail across the hills. Now and then they drop their precious load. The rainwater disappears directly into the porous ground. Disappears but into the porous ground. down in some waters, it re-emerges and keeps flowing all year round. But God caused the water, you see? But a mist went up from the earth and then watered the whole face of the ground. So do all kinds of life. Garden becomes. Sedan. In such permanent oases, creatures of the dry savanna live in immediate vicinity. Gulf of Aden. Aden. Herons come to the desert to fish. Fish is also the diet of the Medusa turtle. Aden, ooh, Aden. Sedan, Eden. It could be a relic from a time when the climate here was much more humid than it is now. Alright, so the part I want to see you now is the limited irrigation of the well naturally regulate the amount of produce. But the few farmers in the Red Sea Hills can get by on what they sell to the inhabitants of Sinai. They sell to the inhabitants. So I'm just showing you that they learn how to use to farm and irrigate that. This is the story of Adam and Eve in real life. You see, and there's no doubt about it. I'm concerned about the hustle. All right, so we can get back to the story. So we've seen where there was no rain. God had not caused it to rain like the dirt, the desert on the earth. And there was no man to till the ground. So that's the problem. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. So the whole ground was watered by the mist that dissipated into the dry, just got absorbed up into the dry, hilly land. But in the beneath, right, the water rises up and they learned how to use this to what? to grow cash crops, right? So God planted a garden eastward in Eden and there eastward in Eden, right? And there he put the man whom he had formed. So now Adam is a laborer. And that's the that's the whole moral of the story, not the he's the first man. And I'm going to prove this, right? And out of the ground, the Lord God made every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. This is cash crites. So flowers, as they showed you, and then food, like the tomatoes that you've seen, right? The tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. So it says the, the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now a river went out of Eden to water the garden, as we see in a river, went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it parted and became four river heads. Now the Sudan is called the Nile River Valley. If you said if you see it's called the Nubian caravan. So the Sudan Nubian is where I'm going. And these people are the first people who built pyramids. Okay? We're going to establish now that the culture that the Egyptians modeled themselves and made on a grander scale came from the Sudan, right? And these are the Moreau pyramids, and you can see it's numerous pyramids in one little graveyard, 220. Brick building is called masonry. So these are the first masons. And if you go from one town to another town to build, that makes you a Freemason. But we'll get into that in the future here. All right. So good for food, pleasant to the sight, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge. Now a river went out of Eden and watered the garden. We've seen that in the sedan. I mean, we already went past that. But um, and part of it came for river's head. So let's get some specific. It says the name of the first is Pishun. Pishun is the name of the first river. It is the one which skirts the whole land of Havilah. Havilah is a character, right? 
And if you look up Havila, Havila refers to both a land and people in several books of the Bible. The one mentioned in Genesis 2, 10, 11, that's where we're at now, while the other place thought to be in Africa and mentioned in Genesis 10, 7. Okay, so we're definitely talking about Africa and we're going to bring that, like I told you, the Bible writer is going to always confirm that. Okay, so we're not going to have to leave, leave in dispute everything. We got to agree with what is obvious. But I'm going to show you that Havila is mentioned in Genesis 10 as a relative of uh, the African family. Okay, so it says right here that um, let's go to Havila, Havila, Rondell, fine, Havila, Havila. Havila, right, is, right, a son of Cush, okay? Havila referred to the Bible, a land um, and people in several books of the Bible. One mentioned in Genesis 2, this is what we're analyzing, 2, 10 through 11, while the other places through, uh, the other place through thought to be in Africa and mentioned in Genesis 10, 7. So we're telling you that the of course this is about the African presence in the Bible. So Havila is mentioned as the son of Cush, which is the Nubian kingdom, right? You know the ancient Nubia. So we're putting the facts with the alleg allegorial fiction because we're trying to tell you that this allegorial fiction has truth to it. It is truth, but it's being truth being told to you in a story. All right, so let's go ahead. So it says Cush begot Nimrod. Who's Cush? Uh, Cush. Um, all right, so the son of Ham. The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Ham is the third son of Noah. Okay. All right. Now, all right. So Noah had Shem, Ham, and Josepheth, and the sons were born them after the flood. Okay. So after the flood, they had sons. All right, and it is going to go through the sons of Japheth. All right, and um, I'm not saying these are not important, but we're doing the Africanist perspective. All right, the sons, their grandsons, the coastline police, and they're called the Gentiles, right? Were separated in their lands, okay? Everyone according to his language, according to their families and their nations. The sons of Ham were Cush, Cush, if you look up Cush, it says the southern part of ancient Nubia, first mentioned in Egyptian records of the Middle Kingdom. In the Bible, it is the country of the descendants of Cush. So Cush is the eldest son of Ham, right? Where we in 10-6, the eldest son of Ham. He's the eldest because he's first mentioned, right? And allegorially, if that's a word, or if that makes sense to you, that based off the allegory, he is the southern part. So his character represents the southern part of the ancient Nubia. That's the reason why we're here. Sudan, I'm just linking you to Sudan, the Nubian people of Sudan, the Kushites, part of the ancient Nubia, okay? First mentioned in Egyptian records in the Middle Kingdom in the Bible is the country of the descendants of Kush. So in the Bible, where we at, it represents the country of the descendants of Cush, okay, the Cushite people, which which are the ones that once we start going into the Moreau pyramids, we'll learn that these the Cushite people still live in the Nile River, close to these pyramids right now to this day. So we put in a we're putting we're just establishing the and if you don't you know you got Sheba, Sedan, you know, Dida, the sons. Alright, so Ham had Cush. We just established that is the first son, which is considered Ethiopia or Sudan. Mizraim, if you look that up, is the Hebrew and Aramaic word name for the land of Egypt, right? The dual suffix axiom, perhaps referring to the two Egypts, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. So that's establishing that there were two Egypts, Upper and Lower, um, based off the now, because the now flows north, so Upper and lower upper is really um, north and lower is south to us in our mindsets 
um, but it's reversed in their mindset. So Southern Nubia is actually the tip of the Nile and North up, I mean, Upper New is the, is in the middle of the Nile from Nubia. So that's telling, I'll show you the progression, natural progression from Nubian uh, culture, traditions, moving into uh, Upper Egypt and then, and then into uh, um, Lower Egypt and then out into the land of Canaan. And then Canaan was a little bit more influenced by Mesopotamian and others because of its location. All right, and it's trade and it's region, and we'll go into all of those details. We're just getting to the basics now. Put, put, we have to look up because it's actually a word named put. So we'll look up, the, we'll search the word put, and when you look, when you put ancient in front of it, oh well, it'll even let you know here. Okay, a biblical figure, a biblical figure. Notice it's spelled with an H here when Greeks, the Greeks put the H in front of it. Put or put is the third son of Ham. In the Bible, biblical table of nation, the name of Put refers to the homeland of the Berbers. Okay, the Berbers lived um, from Libya backwards. The, the Moroccans, the Moors, were Berbers before they were, um, uh, before they converted to Islam, right? Which is all a part of what we're going to end up talking is Islam is an Abrahamic religion. It's, it's the... This Abraham had two sons, Ishmael, just like we I showed you earlier, and the son of Hagar, which was Egyptian, and she found him an Egyptian wife, who made him even his sons even more Egyptian. So this is how you do you doing the blood mixing and like sheep, like I'm telling you, Abram's seed is in the African woman, making him African. Abraham, and then giving his son birthrights down into Africa. But we're gonna go through that. Sarah, he go he has his slave, his male slave, go to his kindred in Mesopotamia and find Isaac a wife and brought her back. And then, you know, then Sarah um practicing the same racial um thing in the north in Syria. So this is the reason why you have the divisions in you know uh here uh, Christianity here, Islam, and here Judaism. The bird, the head of the bird, the one wing, the left wing. All right. So we'll go into all of those details right now. We're establishing that put represents the ancient Libyan territory. All right. So and then Canaan, which is the whole story is all about Canaan because it's the biblical name of the area of the ancient Palestine west of the Jordan River. The promised land, this is the reason, the whole premise here, the promised land. So if you believe in this promise here of the Israelites who conquered and occupied it during the later pattern are the seven, the second millennium BC. So this is where we're talking about this, the whole setting of the Bible. And then it says the sons of Cush, all right, the sons of Cush were, all right, so the son of Cush, the son of the the southern part of Nabah, the sons of the southern part of Nubia, were Seba, Seba, Sheba, Queen of Sheba, Seba, right? Sedan, Dedan. Get what I'm saying here? Sebeka, Sebeteka. This is, um, let's see, let's look it up. I haven't looked at it before. This is Aelin's Bible. Mm -hmm. Hebrew belonging to God was a member of the house of, according to numbers, he was the father. It sounds, I don't know, it sounds um, Egyptian to me, but I'm not going to make any assumptions about it when I don't know. Rama, that's going to actually come to play because Nama was um, a beautiful name mentioned in Genesis. And we're going to come into that later on. But OK. And so, you know, we got to agree with the obvious right so we're showing you how really to piece together the african history in the bible and it is it does take scholarship all right so we establish the difference between created and formed to be brought into existence and to be shaped and configured that man he was formed because there was no man to till the ground which is labor right and then so this Lord God now, Lord is because he has a land, landlord, 
Lord. He has land. Now he has a man who had formed. He's Lord of this man now. So now he's not only a landlord, but he's now a master because he has a, some, a subservient working on his back behalf. Now, Lord God planted a garden and he put the man who he had formed right out of the garden. The Lord God made every tree, but he told his man to stay away from knowledge. This is what you do to slaves. You keep the slaves away from the knowledge of themselves. So I'm not saying anything, but I'm just telling you that this is the, 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 um, the blueprint to making a slave or making a kingdom based off of slaves. And I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. I'm just showing you that this is what is being done. And now we're establishing that these is people coming into the land of Africa. They're doing this in Africa. Havila is the first character mentioned in the Bible. The first human who we know is the son of Cush. Now Cush, we know is Nubia and today Ethiopia. And how do we prove this? Where there is gold. So the whole thing that they're interested in is, it is the one which cursed the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. This is Genesis 2, 11. And gold is mentioned twice. And the gold of that land is good. That didn't need, they didn't need to put it there, right? But they telling you that the gold of that land is good. That is the reason why these, these, mix, these pyramids are missing their heads. Roman explorers that rebranded themselves as Italians, you not no disrespect, but when they came in, they looted the tombs for gold. The people of the dust, the man of the dust, you see the dust there, right? So, bedillium, that, that's a resin. So now we know we're not talking about a god. Bedillium is a rare resin that is used um, and only can be for, um, uh, it's made from a plant that's grown in a specific region of the world. So you got to have gold in the region, bedillium in the region, right? That's used to make perfumes, right? Related to myrrh, okay? And onyx stones. So three different types of items that are valuable to this individual. Three different things that give you affirmation, confirmation that the attributes of these people are, these are people who are treasure hunters, okay? All right, so, uh, I don't know how to get this thing off of me. All right, let's just refresh. Refresh. So, yeah, you know, these things, gold, treasure hunters. Now, I always thought about, like, what type of mentality is a person you know, when you, can you imagine the type of mindset that you must have to come in and destroy ancient masonry, right? And just to find gold, there is 200, like 220 out of them, like 190 something of them, they broke, tried to break into loot, okay? All right, so the name of the second river is Gahun. It is the one which goes around the whole land of Cush. The second character, Mentioned in the Bible. They're Africans, obviously, right? The second character mentioned in the Bible. Right? And it's telling you who they are. It's the eldest son of Ham and the grandson of Noah. They didn't tell you that now because he's this is Noah's not born yet. But the character, the descendants of Cush are that land exists. And to, to even give you even more confirmation, right here in the King James Version, this is the New King Version, that he's called Cush. But in the King James Version, it literally says, it encompasses, encompasses the whole land of Cush, Ethiopia. So they're telling you, Cush and Ethiopia, Ethiopia, the same thing. Goes around, Encompass. I mean, excuse me, not compass it. So it goes around. So it's surrounding the whole land of Ethiopia, the whole land of Cush, the Nile River Valley. And then there was also, there's also the Blue Nile. 
is also part of that. So, um, I don't want to. Let's just see here what we what happens when we put the Blue Nile River falls in Ethiopia. Let's go. So we're on the map. We see the Blue Nile Falls here, the Blue Nile, and you know these these the names are given to it into modern day is not the exact name of them before, but we do know that this is in is still consistent with the land of Ethiopia and Sudan, where once one one region is chopped up now, but here's what we the border what we call Sudan now the modern border these were all one land one nation so this is why it's called Ethiopia on the map so we're talking about Gulf of Aden you flip that around it's Eden right Eden Aden Eden whatever but we have a lot of evidence of the geographical Noki and we know that this is the old world here you know um you know, pretty much here until it became this, you know, centered. So this is really putting real world reference and even to even confirm it. Listen to the details. We, it says the one which goes around the land of Kush. The name of the third river is Hadeko. It is the one which goes towards the east of Assyria. So it is one which goes towards, toward, not encompass, right? Compass, compass. But this one goes toward east of Assyria. So it's a, a river that is flowing towards east of Assyria. So you go to a map and you know, I'm I'm putting this in the Nile River, all right, and I'm because I'm saying it's flowing towards east of Assyria, so it's going in, it's taking me northern towards Assyria is what it's telling me, and Assyria is a kingdom, right, that is dated in the second millennium BC, just like Ethiopia, all right, and Syria is is what is now called northern Iraq, so. Northern Iraq is telling us from the early part of second millennium BC, Assyria was the center of a succession of empires. So like I said earlier, this is the region of Mesopotamia and in the region of, in, the, in that country of Mesopotamia, uh, Assyria was a kingdom in the north. And as you can see, even now we have Syria here. Now the Assyrian people were persecuted later on, but Assyria was known to be a, uh, you know, a mighty kingdom. Okay, a conquering kingdom, fearful, fierce. You see what I'm saying? And there's a lot of history, but it's telling us this is not the beginning of mankind. They're telling you that the kingdom of Assyria is around. The kingdom of Ethiopia is around. You see what I'm saying? We're not talking about the first human beings on the planet. Nations are not being, you know, are around. And we're talking about the second millennium. We're 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 domesticating sheep. You see what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Not just dogs, right? So we're we can put time stamps on these stories. If we read it again, but they tell you, you want to hide something, put it in a book. And I'm trying to tell you what they want to hide most is knowledge of ourselves. And we're going into that now. Okay. Because the first part of domestication, domesticating an animal is to separate the young or separating it from its natural habitat and its providers, its mom and dad. So you separate the child and put it in the institution and then you feed it and get it to trust it. And then you indoctrinate it with you or train it to do it with you want it to do. And then throughout generation after generation, you breed it to become even 